I just, um, I told Rachel, so now she expects me to come on the stage and preach a happy message, you know? <laughs> Rachel has done a phenomenal, phenomenal job. She is an amazing woman of God. This church has been so blessed um, to have Rachel and we continue to have her, but just in different aspects. She is just such a blessing, and just as she was a part of staff, she was just, just such great insights, and a lot of the ideas that we have here are from Rachel. Um, she's just so gifted and talented in so many ways, so make sure you give her a big um, hug today because she's just so phenomenal. Um, so we're, we're continuing this series, Jesus' Death, His Burial, and His Resurrection. And when I, when I begin to look at this idea... The, the death is pretty easy. The cross. I mean, we've all talked about Jesus and the cross. The resurrection. I mean, that's a, that's a no-brainer. I mean, he ro- rises from the dead. But what about the burial? Is there anything significant about Jesus' burial? And so we're going to be looking at this today. We're going to go deep today. We're going to take some time on this today. So it's not going to be just wild. So you're going to need your Bibles today. We're going to go deep on this. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter... 23, starting with verse 50. It's Luke chapter 23, starting with verse 50. So it's going to be, we're going to take this and we'll look at what the Lord says. But before we get started, I want to read to you 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want you, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. So what Paul's getting at here is there's this gospel, this gospel that I received, and I've given to you this gospel. So he's going to get into what is the gospel. Verse 3. For what I received I passed on to you as the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. That's the first one. That he was buried, second part. And that he was raised on the third day according to Scripture. There's three parts to this. His death, his burial, and resurrection. A lot of times we look at his death and resurrection. But why does Paul mention the burial burial here? Is there anything significant about the burial process? Or else, why would he even have to mention it? Why did he just say his death and resurrection? So we're going to look at that today. Sometimes when we read Scripture, we miss the small things. You know, it's like the difference between a guy and a girl. Women, they just notice the smallest details. They, but guys, we just kind of, a lot of nods going on out here. Guys, we just don't get it. You know, everything's the same for us. But women, they know small details. How to, Kirsten dresses me. You know, just they notice the small details and everything. They know how to make things look good. And sometimes in Scripture, we kind of just buzz over things. We go over things fast. And we don't know the small details. And there's so much value in the small details of Scripture. There's a story about this man that was shopping in a flea market in Pennsylvania. And he stumbles upon this $4 picture. And it's got this really nice frame on this picture. And he, he liked this, this, the frame. So he thought, you know, I'll buy the frame. So he buys this picture, brings it home. He undoes the frame from the picture. And underneath the original painting was this, this folded up document. He pulls out this document. It ended up being one of the Declaration of Independence. There's only 26 out of 200 that have ever survived, and he found one of them behind a $4 picture frame. He bought it for $4. He ended up selling it for $2.4 million. True story. He thought there wasn't any value in this picture frame, but it ended up being probably the most valuable thing he's ever received. Sometimes when we look at Scripture, we don't find the true value in the small things. But I pray today as we go into the small details of Scripture— we find such significant value that that would outweigh $2.4 million. That there's such value in Scripture. In Scripture. The details of Scripture. In Luke 24, Jesus is on the road to Emmaus. This is after Jesus rises from the dead. And he's on the road to Emmaus. You can see this here. He's with these two disciples. And they don't recognize that it's Jesus. They don't catch that it's Jesus. And they begin talking back and forth. And finally, Jesus says this to them. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer? And the rest isn't on there. Um, Did not the Messiah have to suffer and die according to scriptures? And then what he does, he tells them. He starts in Moses. 
and he goes through all the prophets explaining that it's all about him. He says, he says, listen, all the way from Moses through the, the Old Testament, through the prophets, was all about me. He begins describing how everything from Moses to the prophets was about him. So I began to look at this and begin to think, okay, so everything was about Jesus? Is that what Jesus getting at? Everything? Even his death had significance. Look at this. Jesus' death. Do you know that Jesus' death was foretold thousands and hundreds of years before he even died? Was foretold. David, a thousand years before Christ, said that the Messiah would have his hands and his feet pierced. That wasn't even, that wasn't even there during David's time. They didn't even do that during David's time. But David writes that the Messiah is going to have his hands and his feet pierced. David also said, or Zechariah said, that they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. What happens to Jesus when he's hanging on the cross? They pierce him with the sword. Then you look at um, Exodus 12, 4. It says that the Passover lamb will have no bones broken on him. And then also David says in Psalms 34, he shall keep all his bones and none of them shall be broken. Well, what happened to Jesus? In John 19, it says, then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first one and the legs of the other who was crucified by him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So Jesus was so exact on fulfilling all the prophets. All these prophets, 1,700 years ago, wrote that the Messiah would have these exact things about him, even being born in Bethlehem. Jesus fulfilled to a T. Now, why did I tell you all that? It will make sense in a little bit. But Jesus fulfilled everything to a T. That's what makes him the fulfillment of all of these prophets have said. So with all that being said, I just want to give you the framework this morning. Is that Jesus, he's a fulfillment. He says that in, in um, Luke 24. We're going to go now to uh, the, 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 the scripture that I told you in Luke 23. So if you have your Bible, Luke 23, 50 through 56. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from Judea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Now, who is Joseph here? If you look at all the Gospels as a whole, Joseph was a rich man. He became a disciple of Jesus, a secret disciple of Jesus. And he was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he was also a, a, a Sadducee. He was part of the council. Verse 52. Going to Pilate, this is Joseph, he goes, to, goes to Pilate. He asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut out by rock, one in which no one had been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body would be laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandments. This is the story of Jesus' burial. This is shown in all the Gospels. You know the virgin birth is only shown in two Gospels? For some reason, God really wanted this expressed, the burial process of Jesus. So let's look at this. Can you show that picture on the screen, please? This is what we usually see when we look at the picture of Jesus being taken down from the cross. We look at this picture, his disciples are there, Mary's there, women are, everybody's there to help with this process. But I want to walk through you what the scriptures say, actually. Could you pull the next slide up, please? This is what all the examples say. That Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in, the, in his own new tomb. Joseph took the body. Mark says that Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in the tomb. Um, Joseph, again, I'm sorry, the, the screens aren't working. There's parts that are missing. I'll read it on the back screen. This is Luke. Going to Pilate, he asked for the body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth. John says that Pil with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. In every single one of the Gospels, it points that there's this man named Joseph who takes down this body by himself. So the question today is, where are the disciples? Where were the disciples? The ones that were seeing Jesus feed 5,000, the ones that saw Jesus raise people from the dead, where are the disciples? They are not mentioned once in the burial process. Now that's significant. That has direct meaning because sometimes we look at the, the, the 
strong religious people, the ones that we feel are so holy and perfect, and they fail. But God chooses whoever to get his mission accomplished. He chooses this unknown, unknown man named Joseph to come out of nowhere and fulfill this prophecy. So you look, you look at this. Verse 53, it says this. He wrapped him in a linen cloth. Now the gospel of John, Nicodemus comes along, and he helps his process. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. So Joseph, he comes, and he takes down Jesus from the cross. Now can you imagine that process? In all the gospels, it shares, shows that Joseph is doing this by himself. Can you imagine pulling down a dead body by yourself? Can you just imagine this picture? He has to pull the nails to the wrist. He has to carry this bloody body down all by himself. He begins to wrap it. Then Nicodemus comes along, and Nicodemus brings something very interesting. He brings a mixture of myrrh and aloes. Now, why does he do that? That is how you would anoint a king. When Nicodemus came with all his mixture and his linen, that is how you would anoint a king in the burial process. He died, Jesus died with the thieves and the wicked. Now, why is this significant? I'm trying to build up to something here. It's going to have a meaning. This is how Jesus was supposed to be buried. We all know the, the story. Joseph comes, takes down the body, wraps it, places it in a tomb. We think, no big deal. But this is how Jesus was supposed to be buried. You see, he died as a criminal, as a thief, as somebody an executed at the highest level in the Roman authority. Uh, in the Roman opinion, as a thief on a cross. Now, according to the Latin poet Horace, it was a Roman practice to leave the body upon the cross until it decayed. He spoke about crucified slaves feeding crows on the cross. So for Roman law, what was supposed to happen to Jesus is that he was supposed to rot on the cross because he's a criminal. That's Roman law. That was what's supposed to happen to Jesus. But in John 19, because of the Jews and the way they did things, they asked for his body to be taken down. It says the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. So the Jews kind of had a different idea about criminals. They don't want any criminals on the cross, so they asked if Jesus' body could be taken down. But this is where the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus' body to be put. It was an area far outside the city of Jerusalem. This area far outside the city of Jerusalem where they threw all the martyred criminals, where they threw all the murdered criminals that died on a cross in a pit. So Jesus, by law, either by the Romans, was supposed to rot on a cross, or he was supposed to be thrown in a pit. That is what was supposed to happen. Now here is where I, I've been building up, and some of you guys are getting a little antsy. This is what I've been building up to. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a suffering servant, right? That is where it goes detail for detail of how Jesus died 700 years before. This is what Isaiah 53, 9 says. He was assigned to a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor any deceit was in his mouth. So 700 years before Jesus, it said that he was assigned a grave with the wicked. He was supposed to be thrown in a pit. He was supposed to rot on a cross, but with the rich in his death. Jesus died as a rich man. The way that they buried Jesus is the exact same way that they would bury a king. 700 years beforehand, Jesus had already planned out his own funeral service. He had already figured out how he was going to be buried. You see, by law, Jesus had, he was supposed to be thrown in, the, in a dump. He was supposed to rot on the cross. This is what was, this was supposed to be. But Jesus had a plan that he would die with the rich. Only rich people had tombs. Are you guys following this? Only rich people had tombs. So Jesus, 700 years beforehand, said that he was going to be buried with the rich. You see, he was buried like a king, even though he was a criminal. He planned out his own funeral. Jesus supersedes all laws made by man. Even in his death, he was still in control. Even at his death, 700 years before him, it was prophesied that he would be thrown. He was supposed to be with the wicked. He was supposed to rot. But he planned out that he would be buried 
with the rich. Scholars have looked at this passage right here, Isaiah 53, 9, and marvel. They cannot understand how a dead man can control the events that happened to him afterwards because there was no way by anybody's law that Jesus should have ever been buried in a tomb because he was a criminal. Jesus was in such control. Now I want to look at some exact points here. The gift of the... When Jesus was born, what happened? He was born in a stable, in a barn. He came in, in, the, in a linen cloth, placed in a, in a stable. Time goes past. The, the wise men come. The wise men come to Jesus. And what do they do? They bring gifts. What do they bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We all know the song. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then when Jesus died, he gets wrapped in myrrh and, al- in, in aloes. Now why? The magi, when they brought the gift to Jesus, that is exactly what you would give. This is a quote. That valuable items were a standard gift to honor a king or a deity. A deity means a god. So when the Magi came and they gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they were giving Jesus the gift of what you give a king or a god. That is what it is too. So when he died, he gets wrapped up as a king. I think what we need to understand here is that even though Jesus was born in a barn, he still was honored as a king. Even though he died as a thief on the cross, he was still honored as a king. I think that we need to understand something. Even though he lived a humble life in all his humanity, he was still a king. He was still in control. He was still the king that he wanted to show. See, Jesus is so organized in every detail of his life. If you study at all the prophets or Moses and you look back, there is such exact detail on how Jesus planned out his entire life to the T. Jesus is more organized than your iPad. Jesus is more organized than your calendar on your app. Jesus is so organized. I'm seeing a lot of kind of confused faces out there. I went kind of fast with this. Jesus has such detail in his life, and he is so in control that even his burial process went according to plan. Even his burial process went according to what a 700-year-old prophecy said. Jesus knew how he was going to be buried. I want to go over a couple lists of what exactly happened at the burial site. You see, the first thing, his disciples weren't there. We need to catch this. His disciples weren't there. So what he did, he gets an unknown man named Joseph. This guy was not mentioned before or even after this part. Joseph comes out of nowhere. He's this unknown man to come and bury Jesus, according to his prophesy. It's like a GPS. You know, when you set your GPS for Chick-fil-A, and you just, you have to get to Chick-fil-A, no matter how many times you go off course, no matter how many times you go to different spots, eventually it will bring you back to Chick-fil-A no matter what. That is the way God is. No matter how many times people go off, no matter how many times people fail, God's will, his sovereign plan will still be done. He will even call an unknown man named Joseph out of nowhere to fulfill a 700-year-old prophecy. Jesus supersedes all the laws, both of the Roman and the Jewish people, when it came to the proper burial process for executed criminals. Now, he was wrapped in a linen cloth. We look at that. Why why is that a big deal? Why, Why did they write linen cloth? Linen cloth. The Greek word for linen cloth is onothon. Onothon. What it means, it describes a cloth made from very fine and extremely expensive materials that was fabricated primarily in Egypt. When Lazarus came forth and he was wrapped in a cloth, it was with poor man's cloth. But when Jesus, when he was wrapped, it was made with very expensive, expensive cloth only used for kings. Only used for kings. The new tomb. Why does it mention new tomb? It says new tomb. It says one in which no man had yet been laid. Now, why did Jesus have to have a new tomb? Why why did they even throw this in the Gospels? Fascinating thing about tombs. Tombs were a family thing. Your family would use your tomb. So your father, his father, his father before him would all use the exact same tomb. It's a generational thing. They would use the same tomb. And what they would do is the body would be laid there. It would decompose. They would put it in a box and put it on a shelf. Then the next person would go in. It's 
like a drive-thru. You know, just this constant rotation that's happening. And they, they keep on keep on moving. That's how tombs were used. That's how it was. So the fact that Jesus was thrown in a new tomb was bizarre in itself because Joseph should have had a family tomb. But it was. But why did it have to be? So when they came, they would find no bones ever. It would always be a blank tomb. Because if there was bones, bones, they'd say, oh, Jesus' bones were in there. But he had to get a new tomb so that there would never be any bones ever in that tomb. There is such detail in this little passage that shows the sovereignty of Jesus in every— Jesus was still in control in this whole time. He was buried with the rich. Nicodemus used a lot of pre preservations. Why? He used a lot. 75 pounds— 75 pounds of mixtures that he would pour on Jesus. And how they would do this is they would take a cloth, pour the ointment on it, lay it, take a cloth. Why did he do that? 75 pounds? It's a little extreme. Well, actually, Psalms, thousand years beforehand, actually prophesied why he did that. Psalms 10 says, Because you will not abandon me, this is talking about the Messiah, me to the realm of dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. The reason why there was so much aloe, so much myrrh on him, is so that his flesh wouldn't decay for three days. If they didn't do that, he would start seeing decay. Nicodemus didn't know that. He didn't know what he was doing, but it was exact on every single detail. Jesus was control of every single detail. So we go on to Luke 23, 55. So now you have the women coming. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. The women were at the burial of Jesus. Now, with my job and what I do, I've been a part of a lot of burial services and uh, funerals, and what I always have noticed is that the burial process is when it sinks in the most what's happened. You know, when somebody dies, it's kind of a shock. You're kind of, you're kind of out of it. Even the funeral service, they're just kind of— But when you get to that burial site, when they put the body in the ground, you realize what's just happened. It kind of clicks with you that this is—it's over for them. And the women were at the burial process. So when you look at Luke 24, the next verse is over. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took their spices they had prepared for them, so what, is, what does that mean? What does that matter? The women were taking spices to anoint Jesus' dead body. They were not expecting him to rise again. Even though Jesus has told them many times, over and over and over, that he's going to die and he's going to rise again, the women were still spring, bringing spices to anoint his body so it wouldn't decay or for the smell. They weren't, they weren't coming with tambourines. They weren't coming, you know, outside the tomb. They were bringing spices in mourning because they weren't expecting Jesus to rise again. That's why even Thomas, he doubted that Jesus had rose from the dead. There was this doubt. No matter how many times Jesus said, I'm coming back, I'm going to rise, I'm going to rise, I'm going to rise, they still doubted. They still doubted. What they saw outweighed their faith in what Jesus had said. In the Los Angeles the police department, what they do for rookies is this. They take a mannequin, they put a bulletproof vest on the mannequin, they take a gun, and they begin to shoot that mannequin in the bulletproof vest many times. And then they um, take off the bulletproof vest, and they see that the mannequin is clean. So they ask the rookies, was the mannequin hurt at all? They said, no. Does the bulletproof vest work? Yes, it does. Then they ask the rookies, so who wants to wear the bulletproof vest now? Nobody ever wants to wear that bulletproof vest. Now, how come? They see that it works. They, they saw it their own eyes, but when push comes to shove, they don't trust it. They f there's this little hint of doubt in that. You kind of see this in Scripture, is that even though they've heard it many times, that Jesus is going to rise from the dead, there was still this hint of doubt. That's why they brought spices. That's why they prepared spices to anoint his body, because they didn't fully believe. Thomas didn't believe exactly what Jesus says. So the question for we, that I have for us today is, do we fully believe in exactly what Jesus said? If Jesus was so detailed in how he was going to be buried 700 years beforehand, can we believe him in our everyday life? life. Everyday life. There is such a sovereignty about God. There is such a sovereignty about how organized every detail about even his funeral, funeral process. And you see here that the women, 
They didn't fully believe it. Thomas didn't fully capture it. The disciples were even questioning it. Even though they were with Jesus, they saw the miracles. They, they heard what he said, but when it came to what they saw, it didn't match what they heard, doubt came in. How about for us this morning? How about for us this morning? We've heard the gospel many times. We've seen, we've heard sermon illustrations. We've seen all that. We've read the Bible. But when tough things come, is the first thing we do doubt? Do we fully trust? Do we fully trust in what God, who Jesus says he is? Do we fully trust in what happened 2,000 years ago? Because if Jesus really died for our sins, literally died, he took the penalty, do we live that way? Do we live trusting that Jesus took the penalty? Do we believe that Jesus took the wrath for us? Do we believe the fullness of the cross? You see, they saw everything. They were at the burial site. They, they witnessed everything. They saw Jesus crucified. They saw all this. Even, Jesus even told us what would happen. But when it finally came to the moment where Jesus was supposed to do what they expected, they doubted. They didn't believe fully. Now, I can't get into their minds or their hearts, but the fact that they would bring spices shows that they were still preparing to anoint the body for the decay process. And so what I see this is, it's a backup plan. Just in case Jesus didn't come through, just in case, you know, he didn't really, didn't really work according to plan, we have a backup plot process for Jesus. Just in case he's not who he says he is. Just in case. Do we have a backup process for Jesus? Do we? Even though Jesus is so detailed in the little things, even about his burial process, even how it all orchestrated, he's so exactly detailed. Do we have backup processes for Jesus? Do we have a backup plan just in case Jesus doesn't come through? Just in case he doesn't fulfill what he says he's going to fulfill in his word? You see, the word believe in the Greek means to live by. To live by. Do we believe in the cross? To believe in the cross is to live by the cross. Do we believe in the resurrection? To believe in the resurrection is to live by the resurrection. If I can invite the worship team forward for the closing part. So I threw a lot at you really quickly. But I want, I pray that what you caught this morning is this. Is that Jesus is so exactly detailed. So exactly detailed. And I know I'm not detailed. I mean, there, there's just things that I miss all the time. I, you know, I, I can't figure this out or this out. But Jesus, he's got everything in control. He is so in control in every circumstance. Even though what you see may be not match and what, what your eyes see may doesn't match what the Word says, but do you still trust in the Word? Do we still trust in the Word? You know, in our culture right now, there is so much going on. I feel like every time I turn on the news, I get depressed. I mean, there's just so much that's happening in our culture, in the world, that causes us to maybe have fear, anxiety, you know, stress. But do we fully trust what this word says? That he's going to take care of us. That he's for us. That he's not against us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. The, the whole point of this sermon series, Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, is do we fully believe? Do we fully believe this? Do we fully believe putting all of our hope, faith, trust in this? Like, are we all for it? That's why Jesus says, I don't, I don't want hot, I, I want either not hot or cold. I don't want that lukewarm stuff. I, I want some of that is for me or not. I want something that's completely for me. And this church is amazing. This church is so amazing. You guys are, I mean, I just love you guys to death. You guys are just so phenomenal. I mean, you guys are just amazing. But I want to challenge myself that as I looked at how detailed Jesus was in every aspect, but I still saw the doubts of Thomas. And I still saw how they had a backup plan for Jesus' resurrection. It made me think, do I have backup plans to Jesus in everything I do? Do I fully trust in what this word says? Every inch of this word? Or is it just a good story? Do I fully trust this in every aspect? So this morning, as we close, I want us to ask ourselves, do we believe? Do we believe? And what that means is, 
do we live by this word? Do we live by this word? Jesus said that the Old Testament talks about himself. Every aspect is about him. Do we believe that everything in our life is for Jesus? Our finances, our families, our jobs, our relationships, everything is for Jesus? Do we fully believe that? And the question goes to me too. Do I fully believe, do I fully live by Jesus in everything I do? So if you could stand with me, we're going we're gonna to sing this song. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray, and I just, if it wasn't for you today, it's for me. There's times in my life where I, here's the nose, I don't fully live by it, where I have backup plans to Jesus, just in case he doesn't come through, where my doubt outweighs my faith. I, I, I have that. But, man, I want to live by it. I want to fully trust. I want to fully believe in everything. I want to fully give my life to this cause. So just for an encouragement today, as a church family, let's believe, let's live by it.